It's important to remember the Oscars are both an American and a global phenomenon. And over their 95-year history, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences has carved out an international horse race for the best foreign language film. So, of course, we had to do it too. In an order that's even more meaningless than usual, because we're going chronologically, these are our picks for the top 10 international feature film winners of all time. But first, a little history. The award for Best Foreign Language Film was renamed Best International Feature Film in 2019 because, in a melting pot like the United States, what does a foreign language even mean? It wasn't actually a regular award until 1957, but both before and since, plenty of non-American and non-English language productions have received special recognition on the Oscar stage. Starting with the first Oscar ceremony in 1929, the Best Picture categories were dominated by American films, with the occasional British production. In 1938, Jean Renoir's French war movie La Grande Illusion became the first non-English Best Picture nominee, and while that's been happening regularly for the last five years, it's something that wouldn't happen again until 1969. Foreign films were far from the norm at the Oscars, but starting in 1947, the Academy decided to bestow honorary awards on non-English film to promote closer relationships between American and foreign artists after World War II. The first film to ever receive this award was Vittorio De Sica's Shoeshine, but perhaps its most important recipient was De Sica's landmark Italian neorealist drama from two years later. Bicycle Thieves, or The Bicycle Thief, is generally considered one of the greatest movies ever made, a legacy the Academy helped cement. Before World War II, the Italian film industry was able to produce lavish historical studio epics like Scipio Africanus, The Defeat of Hannibal, under dictator Benito Mussolini, but its landscape shifted drastically after the war and the collapse of its government funding. This led to more movies shot on location with non-professional actors and a focus on Italy's downtrodden working class. Bicycle Thieves is one such movie about a father, Antonio, who barters his way to reclaiming his bicycle, only to have it immediately stolen. Bicycle thefts were common at the time because of the rampant poverty, after which he and his young son Bruno go above and beyond to try and get it back. It's a sympathetic film, showing us the desperation with which this one family chases after an ordinary object, like it's their one chance at life or salvation. But it's also a film that builds to a startling moral conundrum, about just how far Antonio is willing to go and how far he and everyone around him are pushed by rampant poverty. It's about a father who has no option but to fail in his son's eyes. No recourse except to become part of the very cycle of punishment and backstabbing that hurt him in the first place. And, in the process, it reveals what the conditions like those in Italy at the time can do to the human soul. Writer Cesare Zavattini was nominated for Best Screenplay that year, and De Sica would go on to become the most awarded director in the foreign language category, alongside his countryman Federico Fellini. In fact, an Italian film has been awarded a stunning 14 times, more than any other nation, but the country with the most nominations is actually France, with 37. However, one of France's earliest films to win in the competitive category wasn't actually in French, but in Portuguese, and it was also a co-production with Italy and Brazil. How's that for international? Deca! Deca! Depressa! Depressa! Toma! Toca pra fazer o sol nascer! Não sei! Sabe, Não sim! Não sei se posso! Pode, sim, inventa! A retelling of the Greek legend of Orpheus and Eurydice, Black Orpheus is a romantic tragedy filled with life and music. The 1959 Grand Prix winner at the Cannes Film Festival, Black Orpheus was based on a play by a Brazilian poet, but it was made by French director Marcel Camus and a mostly French crew. The movie can be said to represent the historically Western perspective of the Academy even when it comes to international films, but despite being criticized for its exotic lens, including by US President Barack Obama, it remains one of 
of the most watched and most impactful depictions of Brazilian culture on the global stage, despite its inaccuracies. It transposes the Greek tale to a Brazilian favela, or a working class slum, during the festival of Carnival. And while its soundtrack was more typical of the country's white middle class than the black characters in the film, it led to an explosion in popularity of samba and bossa nova music around the world in the 1960s. After drawing us in with gorgeous landscape shots, its story starts out as light and romantic. It follows an engaged trolley driver named Orfeo and his encounters with a woman named Eurydice, an outsider who arrives in Rio de Janeiro after escaping a mysterious past. The growing complications of their vibrant romance are complemented by equally vibrant scenes of digest song and dance until, eventually, the movie leans into the more melodramatic and tragic elements of the original myth. While Hollywood was still seeing a small number of musicals at the time, that number had begun to steadily decline and the genre would become a thing of the past by the late 1960s, thanks to new Hollywood's focus on grounded realism. Black Orpheus may not have had a direct impact on this change, but it certainly struck a chord with Academy voters at a time of transformation for their own industry. Its musical performances were a far cry from the highly choreographed Broadway-style spectacles of Tinseltown. They were more intimate and unpredictable, sweatier and more visceral, with a much more grounded and realistic approach to bodily movement as its characters got swept up in the energy of song. The dancing was as much for the characters as it was for the audience. The interesting thing about revisiting these winners, or pretty much any list of great films from around the globe, is what they can tell you about the world in decades past. In the case of Black Orpheus, you can get a sense of the way the West saw the cultures of the Global South, for better and and worse, but you can also trace the way politics and borders have shifted over the decades by watching movies from states that technically no longer exist in the way they did before. The 1960s saw a new wave of filmmaking out of the former country of Czechoslovakia, a movement known as the Czechoslovak Film Miracle. It gave rise to directors like Milos Forman, who would eventually make his way to Hollywood, and of course, to closely watched Trains director, Jiri Menzel. In 1965, Czechoslovakia won its first foreign language Oscar for the Slovak World War II film, The Shop on Main Street. But its directors, Jan Kadar and Elmar Klos, weren't considered part of the emerging wave of new cinema coming out of the country. Since they were in their 40s and 50s and had been making established, more traditional movies steeped in social realism. However, Menzel was in his 20s when he made his debut film, Closely Watched Trains, which was also set during World War II, but, like many films of the Czech New Wave, focused on dark absurdities and listless youth. Where the shop on Main Street was about the horrors of war, Closely Watched Trains was about its mundanities. While set in Nazi-occupied Czechoslovakia, it's less of a traditional war movie and more of a coming-of-age story with a distinctly sex-comedy vibe, since it focuses on the young Milos Herma, an insecure train dispatcher with a blossoming crush, who places his self-worth in the idea of losing his virginity and ties the idea of sex to being a real man. The movie draws a number of tongue-in-cheek parallels, including mirroring Mirlosh's fragile masculinity around romance with masculine notions of violence and war. The specter of Nazi occupation is real and immediate, and the story eventually dovetails into a desperate act of resistance, but it unfolds in one very isolated corner of the larger global conflict, as told through the eyes of young characters for whom the normal course of youth and sex is just as important as anything else. To Milos, his inheritance as a trained dispatcher, a job his father once held, is as important as the legacy of entire nations and royal families, and the stakes of his romance are as vital as anything going on in the rest of the Reich, including the trains that pass by daily filled with Nazi ammunitions. It adds a human element to the otherwise inhumane depictions of war machines, and in doing so, magnifies the feelings and forces that permeate even the highest echelons of decision-making that impact the world in significant ways. A number of international war films have been recognized by the Academy. In fact, four of them are on this list, but unlike most Hollywood war movies, which are about the broad devastation of armed conflict, the ones that make it to the Oscars from other countries tend to be either more intimate or more absurd, which is why we're taking a look at not one, but two best foreign language winners from the 1970s, which represent both sides of this coin. 
No conversation on global cinema is complete without Akira Kurosawa. The Seven Samurai director is probably the best and most well-known Japanese filmmaker in Western cinema culture, but while he won an honorary foreign language Oscar for Rashomon in 1951 and was nominated for Dores Kaden in 1971 and Kagamusha in 1980, his only competitive win wasn't actually for a Japanese production, but for the only movie he made in the USSR and the only one he shot on 70mm film. After opening in 1910, Dersu Uzala unfolds in flashback a few years prior during an armed conflict in the Russian Far East. But its focus is on the events of a single memoir, written by Russian army explorer Captain Vladimir Arsenyev. While on a mission to chronicle the flora, fauna, and ethnic minorities of Siberia, he meets a nomadic trapper belonging to the Nanai, or Goldie tribe, named Dersu Uzala. Their friendship lasts several years, during which Arsenyev learns to see the world in a new way, which Kurosawa represents using some of the most stunning and beautiful landscape photography of his career, and simultaneously, some of his most intimate filmmaking when he focuses on his leading characters, isolating them from everyone else. Despite the film being set in the early 1900s and made with a mostly Soviet crew, it's one that was near and dear to Kurosawa, both personally and politically. For one thing, many have read his tribute to Dersu and the introduction of his unmarked grave in the opening scene as a silent acknowledgement of the atrocities of the Japanese Empire, when tribes like the Nanai were almost completely exterminated in Manchuria in the 1930s. For another, Kurosawa had wanted to tell this story as far back as that same decade, and he wanted to shoot on location, though the Soviet government wouldn't allow many foreigners into the region. In 1971, Kurosawa attempted suicide after the commercial failure of Dores Kaden, after which Japanese studios refused to fund his movies. But soon after, his producers were approached by a Soviet studio for a movie adaptation of Arsenyev's memoir. Fate, it seemed, had smiled upon Kurosawa, and much like Arsenyev greeting Dersu after years apart, it was like the filmmaker was reuniting with an old friend. <laughs> Another example of cross-border cinema, black and white in color, was submitted by the West African nation of Ivory Coast, but it was a French co-production directed by Frenchman Jean-Jacques Anneau. A satire on war and colonialism, Anneau drew on his own experiences as a French soldier in Cameroon for his first feature about the African theater of World War I. It's the second of only three African films to win the Best Foreign Language Oscar, including Z from Algeria and Totsi from South Africa, but notably all three were made by white directors. In fact, a black filmmaker has never won the award, only three have ever been nominated, the first of which wasn't until 1995. So much like Black Orpheus, there's perhaps something to be said about who whose perspectives on blackness the Academy has historically valued, a conversation that feels front and center in black and white in color in paradoxical ways. On one hand, its focus is entirely on French colonists drafted into war. And while it tries to ridicule their pompous and racist viewpoints, the camera almost never affords any sense of humanity or interiority to its minor black characters. However, what makes it a powerful film despite this is the degree to which the movie parodies not just French nationalism, but depictions of white saviorhood in Hollywood cinema. The only thoughtful character in its group of racist Frenchmen is Hubert Fresnel, who opens the film with a letter about how he sees humanity in African peoples where most of his comrades don't. But the images in the film rarely show him doing anything about it. He's content being a beneficiary of white supremacy, and while actor Jacques Spicer gives a quiet and thoughtful performance, the character feels distinctly molded on actor Peter O'Toole's version of T.E. Lawrence, who, at the time, would have been active in North Africa. And while Lawrence was a little more complex than your average white savior, it's worth noting that Lawrence of Arabia was part of a long lineage of Oscar-winning movies about white characters set against colonized African and Asian backdrops, like The Bridge on the River Kwai and Casablanca, which, though they're great films individually become part of a limiting pattern. In fact, Black and White in Color has scenes that feel like direct parodies of some of those films, like the moving sequence in Casablanca where the characters sing the French national anthem as an act of resistance against the Nazis. In Anneau's version of the scene, as 
German forces approach in the distance, characters turn to nationalism as kind of a knee-jerk response, making for hilarious interruption. And while the camera may not grant any colonized characters a sense of perspective, the movie's top-down view of white colonial forces battling on opposing sides for control of other people's lands builds to a number of darkly hilarious punchlines, one of which involves the distinctly Lawrence-looking Hubert coming face-to-face -face with his doppelganger on the opposing German side, as if the movie is taking a step back to look at the broader picture of colonial rule that often gets missed when talking about the world wars and the various territories controlled by the Allied powers. You're going to laugh at this. I was a socialist. Ah. Uh, naturally. Because so was I. Up to this point, the best foreign language Oscar had been dominated by Italy and France, but the 1980s saw a shift in which countries would be recognized. Apart from Swedish maestro Ingmar Bergman picking up his third statue for Fanny and Alexander, the next few years would see a stretch of first-time winners, including Hungary, Spain, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Argentina, and the winner we're about to focus on, Denmark, which received back-to-back -back awards in 1988 and 1989. The first of those belongs to a genre that hasn't received nearly enough love from the Academy, even though it represents a part of the human experience just as vital as any of the war and romance films we've discussed so far. We're of course talking about the food movie. Yeah, we live in France, madame. In France, madame. In France, madame. Another film where war informs the backdrop, this time the Franco-Prussian War in the early 1870s, Babette's Feast is about a refugee from the Paris Commune who shows up to work as a housekeeper for a pair of elderly Danish sisters in their remote Protestant village. The film flashes back about 50 years to trace the events and other characters that would eventually lead Babette to seek their employment. Along the way, it shows us the decisions that would lead the two sisters to turn their backs on love and art in favor of staying with their congregation and looking after their father. Decades later, after the village dines on simple, often stale meals like bread soup, Babette introduces some much-needed change to their menu, including wine and fine dining, a meal that not only forces them to appreciate her culinary skills, but also makes the elderly villagers finally open up to each other and confront long-buried feelings and passions. It's about both food as art and art as nourishment for the soul, something Babette brings about with her lavish spread involving turtle soup, champagne, quail puff pastries, rum sponge cake and assorted cheeses and fruits, delicacies which initially frighten the elderly members of the commune. But eventually, trying something new from a foreign culture puts them in touch with themselves in a way they didn't think was possible, which nicely sums up why an award like Best International Feature is important in the first place. It's also an award that helps us connect the past and future of cinema and cinematic movements. For instance, Women Talking makes for a fascinating double feature with a key Best Foreign Language film winner from the 1990s, which is also about women building a community that rejects the dangers of patriarchal oppression, though it takes a radically different thematic and narrative approach. <laughs> Stop. Na buiten. En snel. Often described as a feminist fairy tale, Antonia's line sees its title character, Antonia, returning to her small, casually sexist Dutch village after World War II, during a period of social conservatism for the Netherlands. The film spans multiple decades and follows several generations of women through life and death, and all the while, it traces the way Antonia and her neighbors influence the social fabric of their village, whether by collectively punishing rapists or by shattering social norms. For instance, Antonia's daughter Danielle wants to have a baby, but she also wants to circumvent the traditional route of raising her child with a father, leading to a story of both sexual liberation and single motherhood. It's a wide-spanning tale involving queerness and mental disability and how they factor into feminist movements. But more than that, it's also a story about the vastness of life and death. 
and how even cycles of progress can ultimately be in service of a much grander design. As gentle as it is ferocious, it's also one of the most courageously reflective movies about the ever-present specter of mortality, and how people might deal with it while figuring out how to mold their lives, whether in pursuit of art, independence, motherhood, or academic curiosities. It's a movie filled with possibilities which makes for incredible and imaginative cinema. On the other end of the spectrum, characters being robbed of possibilities and placed in hostile predicaments by forces larger than themselves can be just as compelling. Back on the war movie side of things, we have No Man's Land, the 2002 winner from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Set during the Bosnian War of the early 90s, the, the film by Dani Tanovic takes on an absurdist bent pretty much immediately when it places two soldiers from opposing sides, a Bosniak and a Bosnian Serb, in a trench in the middle of a battlefield, where they're left to take care of a wounded Bosniak soldier lying down on an explosive mine. Between arguments about which side is at fault and moments where the two enemies seem like they might connect over a shared past, the film feels like it's about to stray into a both sides sentimentality removed from real political complication. That is, until it decides to widen its scope when the two soldiers concoct a strange and amusing plan to ask for help. Like all individuals in war, they become part of other people's agendas. In a beautiful, darkly humorous, and ultimately tragic film about the way war robs people of their humanity. Though, on an interesting note, the movie won its award at a time when Hollywood was still ready to accept the absurdity of other people's armed conflicts as a source of art and entertainment. But at the 2002 ceremony, it became clear that the Academy wasn't exactly ready ready to accept the absurdity of American wars in the Middle East, or reckon with its growing Islamophobia. In fact, it would take almost another decade for a Middle Eastern film to finally win the award, at a time when anti-Muslim sentiment was at an all-time high. In 2001, Asghar Farhadi's A Separation became the first Middle Eastern production to win Best Foreign Film, and in 2017, Farhadi became the first Middle Eastern director to win it twice. Part of Iran's second new wave of great filmmakers, Farhadi's movies generally focus on single events that slowly unravel the characters and their relationships from within. In The Salesman, about a couple who work at a theater performing the death of a salesman, husband Imad is hell-bent on tracking down a man who apparently assaulted his wife Rana, leading to a confrontation filled with riveting intensity. But along the way, it's about how the norms of modern Iranian society rob Rana of her agency and dignity, even in her own story. As her relationship with her husband begins to erode slowly but surely. While a reflection of the growing religious conservatism in Iran, which has recently given rise to anti-government protests, the movie also ends up being a time capsule for American politics, specifically because of the Academy Awards. Farhadi, who was considered the likely winner going into the Oscars, wasn't going to attend the awards because of the travel bans put in place by President Trump on Muslim countries. It wasn't entirely clear whether Farhadi would be allowed to attend, but either way, he decided to boycott the ceremony because of the ban. And while his absence was overshadowed by a certain mix up later in the night, two prominent Iranian American space engineers accepted the award on his behalf and gave a powerful speech condemning the recent legislation, proving that as much as the Oscars are about movies, they're also an opportunity for international filmmakers to hold the mic on the world stage. Since then, non-English productions have seen an increased presence at the Oscars in major categories. In 2019, Roma became the last movie to win Best Foreign Language Film, and it was also a frontrunner for Best Picture. In 2020, Parasite took home not only the first ever Best International Film Award, but Best Picture as well, and 2021 saw the one-two punch of Denmark's Best International Film winner, Another Round, being nominated for Best Director and American production Minari competing for Best Picture while being almost entirely Korean. But 2021's winner of the award might be the best example of a film that feels truly international in its storytelling spirit.
Hamaguchi Ryusuke's Best Picture nominee, Drive My Car, tells a story about an affair that actually ends about 40 minutes into the movie, before the opening credits finally roll, and essentially kick off a brand new movie. Based on a short story by Murakami Haruki, the film follows a silent, listless theater director who casts actors from all over Asia in his production of Anton Chekhov's Uncle Vanya. His plays generally feature actors performing in various languages, including Korean Sign Language, all backed by subtitles on a screen, which is not only an interesting theatrical experiment, but forces his performers to look beyond the text of the story and into the subtext, just as Chekhov had intended. But what makes Drive My Car feel spiritually in line with Chekhov's work is the way Hamaguchi directs his actors. Many of Chekhov's plays were staged by the famous Russian theater director Konstantin Stanislavsky, who pioneered a system of acting that would eventually give rise to modern method acting. Stanislavski believed the heart of Chekhov's work wasn't in the lines that he wrote, but in the silences between words, which is the kind of approach Hamaguchi takes to his lead actors, Kafuku and his driver Misaki, who spend long car rides together in a state of suspended animation, repressing the guilt of their respective tragic pasts and the loneliness that now defines them. It may not have been a work about the pandemic, but as the first winner of the pandemic era, it tapped directly into the kind of isolation and feelings of drifting quietly through life that many people had been feeling for the prior 12 months in lockdown, making it a perfect reflection of life in the modern era. Whether it's movies about post-war poverty, dance and romance, coming of age, deep friendship, shallow leaders, the joys of food, the sorrows of death, the absurdities of war, the selfishness of men, or reflections of the self, works like these from around the world can offer unique perspectives on every dimension of lived experience from vastly different perspectives. And they're all worth watching, whether to learn something about the world or something about ourselves.